Okay, guys, let me pay attention. Look at me. My wife's favorite verse. What? Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. And again, I say, rejoice. So even if you're miserable in your circumstances, you can rejoice in the Lord, even when you're, that's something a, a, a mature Christian needs to learn. I'm not happy right now. I don't like circumstances right now, but I'm, I have the joy of the Lord giving me grace and strength and peace. He's going to get me through this. And then last time, if Christ has not been risen or raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. I'm sure I said this yesterday, but if, if, if our faith is all about Jesus rising from the dead, dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead. And I think I probably mentioned this, but there are people who call themselves Christians. This has been true for decades, many, many years, a long time ago, before I was born even. Who would call themselves Christians, but if you said, do you believe Jesus really rose from the dead? They said, well, maybe sort of figuratively, you know, in the minds of the... No, 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 no. He literally, physically, historically rose from the dead. And God gave lots of evidence for that. And that's what our faith is all about, trusting Christ risen from the dead. He's alive. And... Uh, and if you don't believe that, you're not really a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian. Some people do. But they just believe kind of in a spiritual sense he's risen, which is nonsense. And he said, in that case, you might as well just go home. Your faith is preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. And then today's verse is from the same chapter, a few verses on down. And it's, it's in this case, Paul is introducing, to make a point, he's introducing a proverb that, uh, that was a common proverb in that day. But he starts out by saying, do not be... And the seed, yeah, this is a this is a common command in the Bible, the first part of it. Hector, what are you looking at? Is your what? Your feet? Okay, okay. Well, stay with me. Uh, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. We've got an enemy, guys, right? What's his name? Satan or the devil. Yeah, Satan or the devil. Uh, and there are demons. The Bible doesn't tell us how many, but we know there are Probably millions, maybe billions, maybe trillions. We don't know how many there are. God didn't tell us how many he created. He said a third of them rebelled against him. Satan convinced them that he had a better way, which we don't fully understand. But when that happened, it perverted their minds. Now, guys, listen. This happens to human beings as well. If you let yourself start rejecting truth, God's truth, your brain starts getting messed up. You start thinking weird things. You start getting mentally messed up. You could call the word, you could use the word depraved, certainly deceived. But people start thinking weirdly and they, they're convinced they're smart. There are people who have PhDs, okay? Lots of education. And they think they're really, really smart because they know all these, they study, they've read all these books and they know all these vocabulary words and they know a lot about something in God's creation. And they think, boy, I'm so smart. But they reject God and then their, their thinking's messed up. They're deceived. And so God warns us, you've got an enemy and he's trying to deceive you and he will if he can. He will try to make you believe lies. So you got to make sure you know what the truth is and know how to stand firm in the truth and know why you believe what you believe. I mean, that's just part of it. Now, you can say, why did God just do away with those guys? Why, why, why does he let those demons do that? Because he's, he's economy-minded. God's got a purpose in that. He's using Satan and his demons now. Satan and his demons hate God. And the only way they can hurt him is to hurt us because they know God loves us. And so... They try to, their best to do some damage to us or deceive us or get us away from God. And God lets that happen because he's training us for eternity. Now, we don't know all that that means, but God's got an eternity in mind for us with him. And it, it's not just sitting on a cloud playing a harp. And we're going to be doing things in eternity that require us to be prepared, to be, to be overcomers. We've got to learn how to overcome and resist the enemy and stand firm and and trust God in spite of difficulties and trials and tests and deception. So that's part of it. And so that's why it's going on. And so he says, now, you're in a war. You, there's an enemy who's a deceiver, and I don't want you to be deceived. Now, that's, that command shows up a lot in Scripture. But in this case, he's got a, a little proverb here. Does anybody recognize this proverb? I know it. Opposite of good. 
bad company, bad company. And, and this word in some translations starts with a C and some translations starts with an R. Uh, it does something to good morals. Bad, bad company does something to good morals. Corrupts or ruins. Corrupts or ruins good morals. Yep, that's it. Bad company ruins or corrupts good morals. Now, let's think about that for just a minute. What God's wanting us to think about here is this. He, he, said, he said, okay, every time, via you okay? You're not going to sleep on you. Every time people interact, and people interact all the time. God intends for us to interact. God loves that. He created us to interact. In fact, he commands us to have fellowship with each other in Christ. You know, we're, we, we, got, we, we need to go to church because we, we encourage each other that way, and we learn that way, and we grow that way. And we, so God intends for Christians to encourage each other, strengthen each other, help each other see their blind spots. You know, I mean, we all have stuff we need to learn that we can't see unless somebody helps us see it. God intends that. But every time that kind of interaction goes on, there's several possibilities. One is you've got a person over here and a person over here, and they both really love Jesus. And they're interacting and, and, and communicating, and they're helping each other grow stronger in the Lord. They're helping each other see their blind spots. They're helping each other learn more about Jesus. They're, they're helping each other do better in the Lord. You know, it's good stuff. You know, it's, it's really encouraging. But sometimes you've got one person who's really strong in the Lord and another person who's not really at all that into the Lord. And so they're interacting. And, and sometimes this person who loves the Lord is encouraging this person to, to consider Jesus and to, to think about their life and try to get their life right. And this person may be listening. They may be, hey, you, maybe you got something there. And God's using this person to bring this person into the kingdom of God. You know, that, that happens. That's good. Stuff. That's good. That's right. But many times, the person who's supposed to be a Christian is not very strong, him or herself. And here's a person over here who just couldn't care less. And they're interacting and being friends. And this person wants to do things that this person knows I uh, shouldn't do that but they're not very strong so when this person says ah, come on let's have some fun and this person says, I don't think that's very good fun I don't think I ought to do that and then the, then the, the other person says, oh man don't tell me you're one of those bitty two shoe people oh come on I didn't think you were that kind of person let's have fun don't be it's not a big deal alright then you got to decide what, who's influencing who here you see what I'm saying because it's, that's bad company Influencing you to do bad things, and it happens all the time, all the time, all the time. Very, very common. I've had dear friends who are dead because of this. They had a friend who, at one point, said, "I know some people get in trouble with drugs, but listen, it's a lot of fun. If you don't just go build and abuse it, you'll enjoy this. It's fun. Try it. You'll like it." Okay, and and they start. They didn't, they didn't think it was going to end bad, but now they're dead. I've got friends, people that I love dearly who are dead because of the same thing with alcohol. They had somewhere on their line, it's this, and they knew in their mind, no, I don't need to do that, I don't need to get into that, but they did, and now they're dead. It led down a road that led to their death. And, and so bad company not just ruined, doesn't just ruin good morals, but ruining good morals has consequences like death. Or misery, or a messed up life, you know. Guys, you got choices to make, and there are going to be people in, all around you, maybe in the school, maybe maybe at church, maybe neighbors, maybe friends in other schools, and they're going to be encouraging you to have an attitude or to do something that's ungodly, that's, that's bad, that doesn't honor the Lord. And you're going to have to decide do I have the guts to stand firm? Do I know how to stand firm in the Lord? Uh, what if they get mad at me? What if they laugh at me? What if they roll their eyes at me? What if they say I'm acting like a goody two shoes? What, what else do they used to call us? Goody two shoes? Or it seemed like there were some other names. <laughs> Holy Joe? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Anyway, anyway, you know, you got You got to decide. I don't care what people call me. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm here to glorify the Lord. I'm not going to do what you're saying I ought to do. That's just silly. I'm not going to do it. And if they say, well, you know, I'm not going to hang out with people like you. You're not any fun. Okay, fine. Go go your way. You need to be strong enough to do that. You have to decide. And you'll pay the consequences or you'll receive the benefits with whatever you do. Just keep in mind when two people interact, somebody's influencing somebody. Somebody's influencing somebody. And make sure you're, as a Christian, influencing people for the Lord, not being influenced to do the wrong thing.
Okay, um, let's memorize it. Do not be deceived. 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 Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company ruins good morals. Do not be deceived. Yeah, bad company ruins good morals. And I put the King James, the British call it authorized version, uh, up here just because I want to make a point. I love the King James Version. I memorized a lot of the scriptures of the King James. I studied it a lot. But it's hard for people today because English has changed over the period since 1611. You know what I mean? It's pretty different over 400 years. And so you've got to be kind of tuned into that because if you just read King James and you read this, do not be deceived. Suppose you hadn't seen this yet. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You're saying, what does he mean? Communications, that's just talking to people, maybe or writing letters to people or something in those days. Evil communication. So if, if I say bad things, or if I brought bad things to people, evil communication, we're up good manners. Manners, that's got to do with uh, saying please and thank you and and being gracious and maybe having good manners at the table, t- center table, being polite and using the right fork, using my napkin correctly and all that sort of thing. I don't get it. Well, of course, what happened, what this means is in King James Day, communications didn't just mean the words that came through your mouth, but your whole life, you know, interacting with people. You can see how that's related. Bad company, when you're with somebody, you communicate, so you can see kind of how that's related. But corrupt good manners, good manners in King James Day, that meant the manner of life that you live, the way you lived your life, not pol- politeness and stuff like that. So you can see how that would have to do with good morals. So you, you got to be careful with King James that you really understand what the words mean. So, anyway. Okay, anything you want to say before I pray? Yes. Monday, man. over the last Yeah, that's really tough. Okay. Um, also, I've, I've got, before I forget, Melissa came in and asked me to tell you, and I think everybody's supposed to tell all their classes this period. Uh, after this class, normally we have chapel. Today we're not having chapel. Do you know what we're having? Do you know, you know what's going on? They're calling it a club fair. Okay. Now listen, this is what this is what's happening. This is what's happening. They want you to be as involved in as many clubs as you can be and as you want to be that are going to be going. We're going to have more clubs this year in the school than we've had before. And and every club will have a sponsor, a teacher. And we'll be down there. I'll be doing the Bible Memory Club just like I've done in the past. But I'll be down there to give you information about the Bible Memory Club. And other teachers will be there to give you more information about their clubs, too. They're wanting you to go around to all the teachers at all the desks and see what they've got to offer you. And if you're interested in, you know, take their information or whatever. I don't, I don't know what all the other teachers are doing. I've just got some handouts that I'm going to give people who are interested. So you, you, it'll, just, it'll be a little tedious because we just don't have any room up here. You know, it's so tight the way it is. But uh, the best you can, get around it. Now, please, it's important. She and we will not be happy if you just try to skip it. You see what I'm saying? You may have to back off a little bit till till people get around or whatever, you know, and you may not be able to get through quickly, but but get there as quickly as you can and don't just don't just skip it. Okay, take take advantage of it. All right. Is that clear? Okay. And you can be a member of more than one club because I mean like I, I would like for everybody to be in the Bible club and you don't have to be at all the Bible club meetings necessarily, but you, you can still be in the Bible club. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Today from my uh, golf match. Okay. Today. Yes. Okay. 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 Ready? All right. Father, thank you for these kids, and thank you for this time we have with you. Lord, I pray that you would help them to take this passage of scripture very, very seriously. Lord, help them to realize how easy it is to be deceived. Lord, I know there's so many kids that want to be—I don't know—we say cruel. They want to be thought of well by people who are in certain groups and and lord i know that can turn out to be such a disastrous disgusting bad mistake and i pray you'd help these kids to get past some of that lord please don't let them be deceived by what other people think or how other people feel about them or having to improve themselves to somebody else or having to have a certain attitude or certain uh, look or a certain way of responding to things lord that that's uh, supposed to be cool. Lord, help them not to be deceived. I know we have an enemy who's very crafty and very good at that. 
And Lord, help them to evaluate their relationships with other people and be able to discern whether they're being influenced or not or whether they're influencing others. Some of these kids, I don't know, Lord, I don't know if they love you. I don't know if they know you. I don't know how much they love you. I don't know whether they're influencing people maybe badly in some cases, maybe influencing people to have a bad attitude or have a rebellious spirit. I don't know. And maybe others, Lord, are, are doing their best to influence people for Jesus in a positive way. And, uh, and and others are just kind of on the fence. And Lord, I know they can't last very long and they'll go one way or the other. So I pray you'd help them make good decisions and to remember that, that to not be deceived because bad company will eventually corrupt good morals if we don't if we don't handle that right or they'll leave us. So Lord, help us to think clearly about these things. I pray for uh, Via's me. I pray you'd comfort her, Lord, as she grieves over the loss of this little puppy. Lord, you know, we've lost a puppy not long ago ourselves and it really, really hurt so difficult and i pray for mercy for them and lord i pray for via as she goes to her golf match i pray most of all that she will glorify you in that match lord that I'd, I'd like to see her do well but lord ultimately i want to see her make good decisions and have a good sweet spirit and a good christian attitude and do the things that will glorify you the most and represent you well at that match I pray for the others as well is there anything else i need to pray about guys mm-hmm. so lord thank you for hearing our prayers thank you for this time we have with you and Lord, I know some people back here are not really paying attention to you. They're not praying. They're they're playing. And I pray right. Don't talk. I'm talking to the Lord. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So Lord, I pray you'd help these kids make good decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Hector, come out here a minute. Cash flow plans do not work because you leave things out. That's why we're going to go through a whole budgeting system here to, because it's a checklist of little things that sometimes will sneak up on you and you forget about. You forget about soccer pictures. You know, you forget that cars break down, car repairs. You forget about these things. And if you go through a little checklist, you'll go, oh, that, that, that. And then when you start adding it up, you get a more realistic picture. When your budget is not realistic, when it's just a wet finger in the air, then that's when you have crashes in your budget and you're going to end up with a lot more emergency budget committee meetings. Cash flow plans don't work if you overcomplicate your plan. If the nerd goes into steroid overdrive and the budget is 66 pages long and it takes a master's degree in business, an MBA to understand your budget, no one's going to live on that in our busy, busy culture, our go-go culture. You're not going to do that. You have to keep your busy, you have to keep your life simple enough in this busy world with the budgeting so that you actually do it. That's the trick. Because that's the other reason they don't work, is people don't do a budget. You see, a budget won't work if you don't do a budget. This is not hard. And we need to do a different budget every month. We're going to start and spend this coming month's money on paper before the month begins. Every month, do a different set of forms forever. Now, eventually you'll get to where the kinks are worked out and it'll be pretty smooth. And most of that is repetition. But for the first few months of doing this for the practice and to build the muscle in your character, do the details, do lots and lots and lots of little details for those three months in particular while you're in Financial Peace University. So do the budget and then a budget won't really work if you don't actually live on it. So you can do it and it's all theory and you didn't get anywhere. You actually have to live on the budget. On paper, on purpose, you write it all out, you got a game plan with your spouse, you pinky swear and spit shake, the nerd and the free spirit are together, we're walking forward, and then you just go do something that had nothing to do with what was written down. You actually have to do what you wrote down. You can't spend any money ever again except what you wrote down. And if you don't like what you wrote down, you know whose fault that is? Yours. So change it. If you want to change it, it's yours. Change it. But change it if you're married with your spouse. Because if you go home and go, honey, look what I did. That's, that's not the rule. Okay? We're going to do this together. A written plan, if actually lived on and agreed on, will remove much of the man- management by crisis from your finances. If you're going through this class right now and you are struggling with money, things are really tight. Maybe you're even behind on some bills and, and you just really don't know what to do. What you've got to do first is you have to establish what we call your four walls around your house. You have to put up the four walls of your home. Take care of your own household first. Before you do anything, do food. Then do shelter. And then do utilities. And then do clothing and transportation. 
food, shelter, clothing, transportation, utilities, before you do anything, about 20, 25% of the people that come into our offices for counseling or meet with one of our counselors across the nation that we've trained, about a fourth of them come in and they're current on MasterCard of the student loan and behind on their house. Is that backwards? Say yes. yes. If you're going to be behind on something, let MasterCard squeal like a pig. All right? But be current on the house. Never get behind on your house while you pay some other goober somewhere. Never let your lights get cut off while you pay some other goober somewhere. You've got to keep this stuff in perspective and set priorities when you're in crisis. Now, what Sharon and I did and what we teach people to do is, if you're in crisis, of course, you have to assess the situation. What are we going to do to earn some more income? What are we going to sell so that we can get this thing to balance? But in the meantime, we're doing a budget and we're going to spend that money on paper until the money runs out and we draw a line where the money runs out. When the money runs out, everybody below that line, that month doesn't get paid. There's not enough money. I wanted to pay them, but I didn't have the money to pay them. And I'm going to decide on purpose, on paper, before all the yelling starts, who I'm going to pay. Now, I don't like that. I want to pay them all. But I'm going to draw that line there. And we had one guy call up as a credit card collector, and he's screaming at me on the phone. <laughs> call my mother names and all this stuff and he's going on with all this stuff and all these threats and we're going to take your firstborn and you know and all these things they just they come up with some bizarre stuff don't they and I said well listen man you know I'd really like to pay you but you're below the line <laughs> and he said what do you mean and I said well every month we do our bills we lay everything out and we draw a line where the money runs out and we pay everybody above the line, and those that are below the line, we want to pay them, but we can't pay them this month, and this month you're below the line. And he said, you're kidding. I said, do I sound like I'm kidding? A little pause there. So how do I get above the line? You're nicer next time you call, you twit. Gee. But you're beginning to get the idea how this deal works, right? Uh, manage money. When you make your money behave, it stretches, it goes further. Because managed money has more muscle. It works harder. It, you know, when you manage your time, you get more out of your day. It's the exact same situation. A written plan, if actually lived on and agreed on, will remove many of the money fights from your marriage. It'll actually cause a money fight in your marriage if you're not careful the first time you sit down. I've warned you of that already, right? So be careful, nerds and free spirits. Do this gently. It's painful, this thing called change, okay? But long term, if you get together on where you spend your money, when you agree on your spending, you've agreed on your dreams, you've agreed on your fears, you've agreed on your goals, you've agreed on your priorities, you've agreed, you've created unity in your marriage. It's powerful stuff. It'll remove much of the guilt, shame, and fear that could be associated with buying something like food. I remember distinctly when we were broke, standing at the grocery store, writing a check, wondering if as I wrote that check, I was afraid I had just spent the money to pay the light bill with because we didn't have a plan. We were out of control. I'm going, I, and I couldn't, I didn't have it in my head, and I remember kind of sweating. You, you ever had that feeling where you kind of get a little bit of sweat on your upper lip, a little bit in your hand, when there's a little fear? Did anybody ever do that but me? Say yes. yes. Yeah. And I, I, remember, I remember writing that check and going, man, I had this, this feeling in me. that, And I was really glad when I got home and we added it all up and I had the money to actually pay the electric bill and keep it on. You'll never have that feeling again when you have a written plan. Because you got the light money and then you got the money for groceries and everything is laid out there in order and you know exactly what's going on. It gives you this sense of power, this sense of destiny with your money. It will remove many of the overdrafts from your life, the, the bounced checks, the bounced debit card transactions. And that stuff, as we've already discovered, is very expensive. And it will also, of course, in the process of doing that, remove a lot of stress. A written plan, if actually lived on and agreed on, will remove overspending on a certain area. Just like the guy I talked about, he's overspending on restaurants, and so he didn't have the money, quote unquote, for retirement because of mismanagement. Not because he didn't make enough, but because he didn't have a plan. He didn't have it laid out. He hadn't given every dollar on paper, on purpose, a name. And if you don't tell your money what to do, as John Maxwell said, you will always wonder where it went.
to have a budget to be wealthy because there's no way you're going to be wealthy without you know having a spending plan and using your money wisely. Now the zero-based plan is where every dollar has a name before the month begins. Income minus outgo equals exactly zero. So you have to figure out what you're going to make and then spend that on paper. And we're going to do that with a form system here in a few minutes. But that's the basic idea. Every dollar has a name on, pre, on paper, on purpose, before the month begins and in agreement with your spouse if you're married. If you're single, you have somebody else look over it to make sure you know where you're going and what's going on. Also, about the time we went broke and started doing budgets, we started with doing the budget, we started doing this thing called the envelope system. It has been around forever. And all the envelope system is is this. We figured out that on some things, we get automatically drafted out of our checking account for mutual funds or for insurance, they automatically draft us. For our utilities, they automatically draft us. We just want all of that on autopilot. That's fine. Other things, we write a check and mail the check through the mail, right? But other things, when we would go into the grocery store or we would go out to eat or we would go shopping for clothing, we would have a set amount and we never knew if where we stood with it. We would always be a little over or not over and we wouldn't be in balance and we'd come home kind of with that feeling again that maybe I just spent the money that should have been used for something else. And we discovered how to fix that. And we actually kind of discovered it while we were having a big fight about the grocery store. Because Sharon's like, you don't give me enough for groceries. And I'm like, you spend too much at groceries. And <laughs> you know how that works, right? <laughs> and, and it really wasn't a pleasant conversation where we came to a mutual agreement. It was more like a knockdown drag out. And I said, okay, here, here's, the, here's what we're going to do. I, I read about this thing with Larry Burkett. We're going to try this. How much do you need for groceries in a month? And she said, well, I, I could do it on, 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 on $600, but if you give it to me every time and not gripe at me, I could do it on $500. And I said, well, all right, we can do that. This was a long time ago when $500 was a lot of money. And so we got an envelope out. We wrote food on the envelope. And at the first of every month, or on the first and the 15th, if you get paid that way, we would put $500 or 250, 250 in cash in the envelope. And then you don't buy anything out of the food envelope except food. And you don't buy any food ever except out of the food envelope. And so if you go out to eat and you forget the food envelope, you have to turn around and go back home and get the food envelope. No cheating. We did that one time. I can show you the location where we turned around in the parking lot of this place to go back home and it surprised the babysitter, kind of scared her. <laughs> and went back in and got the food envelope and then we went out to eat. When we did that, when we went, no, we can't go write a check or we can't hit the anytime teller, we've got to stick with our system. When we made the effort to turn around, drive back to the house three or four miles there and surprise the babysitter, something clicked inside of us and our life started changing. Because there was a moment there where we drew a line in the sand and we said, we're not going to misbehave anymore. That's a big deal. And so we said, we're going to have the food envelope. We're buying all of our food out of the food envelope. Clothing envelope. How many of you buy clothing and then somebody at your house gripes at you about that? Hello. No, no be careful. <laughs> okay. What if you had an amount in the clothing envelope that you had agreed to and it can't be spent on anything except? Clothes. Then you'd never get griped at if you bought Clothes. with that money, right? because that's all it can be spent on. As long as you don't go over that amount, then there's no griping, because we all agreed on this amount in our budget. That's how it ended up in the envelope. To this day, if you talk to Sharon Ramsey and you get her to open her purse, you'll find the, our deluxe envelope system in her purse right now. We still do envelopes every single month. We don't do many of them. We only do three or four things with envelopes. But we still write out a check that includes the food, it includes the entertainment, it includes the clothing, and we cash those checks and we put that amount of cash in each of those envelopes with those labels on them, and it keeps us from overspending that category. Because if you look in the food envelope and there's no money in the food envelope, you don't order a pizza. You warm up leftovers. Shocking. <laughs>really new tires or a car breaking down aren't unexpected things. These are things you can count on. Tires wear out and cars break. So you always need to have two things going. One, you need to have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. And two, in your budget, be budgeting for car repairs. Uh, to not do so is pretty naive because cars break. You can count on it. If you don't already have your own checking account, now is the time to get one. It's a great way to learn how to be in control of your money and keep track of what's coming in and what's going out. To get started, shop around. Some banks charge fees for checking accounts, so you'll have to do a little research to get the best deal possible. 
Look online or visit local banks to find a free student account. It's also important to understand how to use your debit card and what fees you might pay for using it. For now, know this. You can use your debit card in a store to pay for things like food or clothes, or online for things like movie tickets or music. Banks usually don't charge fees for those transactions. You can also use your debit card at an ATM to withdraw cash. That's where fees come in. Ask your bank what ATMs you can use for free and which ones will cost you money. And please don't buy overdraft protection. Overdraft protection lets you borrow money from the bank if you spend more money than you've got in your account. Of course, they'll charge you fees for the service and interest on the amount you borrow. That's basically just like another form of going into debt. What the bank doesn't know is you're on a budget. So you don't need to pay anyone to babysit your bank account because you won't be overdrafting. When you open up a checking account, go ahead and open up a savings account too. The checking account is where you'll spend your money and the savings account is, you guessed it, where you save. Guys, it's much easier to actually save your money for big stuff if you put it into a savings account. With your budget in place and a plan for how much money you'd like to save out of each paycheck, you can even set up an automatic transfer to your savings account. By the time you see your paycheck, the savings are already taken out. You probably won't even notice the difference. It's a beautiful thing, really. Trust me, it's so much fun to watch your savings account grow automatically. Whenever I talk to high school students about budgeting, I always get the same response. Budget, but I don't have any money. And I always say the same thing. Yes, you do. You've got some money. You just need to think a little differently. If you have a part-time job after school, or even if your parents give you an allowance, or like we teach a commission for doing work around the house, you've got some money. But it even goes further than that. Do your parents buy your clothes? Do you ever go to the movies or go out to dinner with friends and your parents pay for it? Do you have to pay for cheerleading or sports or band fees? Do you put gas in your car? All of those things represent dollars that are flowing right through your fingers, even if your parents are giving you the money for all of it. So don't tell me you don't have any money. Chances are you're spending a lot of money every month already. And all we want to do is just plan how you're going to spend that money before you actually spend it. That's all a budget is. It's a spending plan for your money. You are telling your money what to do and where to go. The first thing I want you to do is to talk to your parents about all the things they pay for every month for you. Instead of having them just pay for all the stuff individually one at a time, ask them if they'll figure out how much money they'd end up giving you for the entire month anyway. And just deposit that one lump sum in your bank account. From there, it'll be up to you to budget that money and to make sure that you're paying the fees, getting the school clothes, buying the movie tickets, all that kind of stuff. Now, your parents aren't going to do this if you don't have a budget. And that means you're going to have to have a budget. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to prove to them that this is going to work. If your folks go along with it, especially if you already have an income from work, then you have a pile of money to manage every month in this scenario. If you get the hang of this while you're still in high school, you'll be a pro by the time you're out of school and working for real. Now, I know that your expenses today aren't the same kinds of expenses you'll have later in life, so we developed a student budget form. So, no more excuses. Starting this month, you have to do a written budget every month for the rest of your life. That's what people who win with money do. Take a look at the form. The first thing you'll do is write down how much money you have coming in on the income blank. And that includes all your income, whether it's from your parents, a part-time job, cutting grass, babysitting, even birthday money. Then go down the list and write down every single thing you know you have to spend money on for this month. We're talking everything here. From your clothes, to your club dues, to your cell phone bill. If you think you're going to want to see a movie or go to a concert sometime this month, then write it down. The whole point here is to spend every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Every dollar has a mission. Every dollar has a name. 
The goal of the budget form is to have your income minus your expenses equal exactly zero. That's what we call a zero-based budget. And that means every dollar of your income is accounted for and has a job to do. If you subtract your expenses from your income and then you have money left over, then go back and spend or allocate that money somewhere on the paper. You could put it in savings, you can give it, or you can just eat an extra pizza that month. I don't care what you do with it as long as you do it on paper, on purpose. I want you to plan what you're going to do with your money. If your expenses are more than your income, then you've got a problem. That means you busted the budget. And since we don't borrow money or use credit cards, it means you have to go back and adjust something to get that final number to zero. You're going to have to cut spending somewhere in the budget. You may not be able to go to that concert. You may not be able to buy those jeans this month. Or you may have to choose between one or the other. Hey, that's life. That's the real world decisions and issues you face every single month of your adult life going forward. This form isn't rocket science. It's basic math, folks. But once you get the hang of it, this little form will set you up to win big time. From now on, do a budget every month. Well, it's always a good idea to just have a plan, anything you're doing. Uh, those that begin with the end in mind are those that complete the task. Stephen Covey says in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, begin with the end in mind. And, and so if you've got an end in mind with your exercise regime, with your spiritual walk, uh, with your academics, hey, you need to like, make sure you get all the classes so you get the degree, you know, that's a plan. And, and so having a plan usually is going to cause you to be able to hit your goals versus just kind of wandering around. And so budgeting actually applies to almost every area of your life. Next, next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for this time we have with you. Lord, help all our kids understand. I know some of them really love you, Lord, but, but I know we have a lot of kids who really aren't Christian. Some of them think they are. Some of them have been to church and made decisions, quote unquote, but they're not really Christians. And Lord, help, help our kids to realize how important it is not to disrespect you doing prayer or disrespect me doing prayer. But help them to all make sure they're praying during prayer time. And if they don't believe in prayer, to act like they're praying. And, uh, and to show respect. So, Lord, help us now the rest of this day to bring you glory. I pray you'd bless the the uh, the uh, club fair and pray you'd help kids get where they need to be as far as clubs are concerned. And I pray that you'd help us to uh, just walk with you, help these kids get ready for the test next time, and uh, just help us to bring you glory, Lord, make good decisions and stand firm. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay in the battle.